Hello everyone and welcome to another I Work in Sports live interview. And um, yeah, this today will be a super cool talk uh, with a good friend of mine, Gabriel Ber Andrade, a sports psychologist, is uh, just waiting to, to come in. Before we get to that, if, you, if it is your first time here, let me introduce myself. My name is João Figerio. I'm the founder of I Work in Sport. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, in this interview series, basically what uh, we try to do is to talk to accomplished sport business professionals that come here and share their experience, tips and advice in order to help you succeed in your career. Um, we, well, it will be a super um, interesting uh, conversation with, with Gabriel. Uh, just to let you know before we go to that, this is, of course, our uh, social media channels. You find as I work in sports, you know, singular without the S at the end uh, in all these uh, media platforms. I will invite you to, to let me know if you're already watching, if you're there, uh, if you want to say hi, tell me where you are watching from. That would be great. Um, also, let me know. Uh, let us know if you are already working in sport or if you're just preparing, if you're studying, if you're about to graduate. Let us know what um, your situation is because we will, of course, invite you to ask questions and participate in it as well. Just before we start, um, I took a decision uh, just before we started that uh, I wanted to take just one minute before we invite Gabriel in uh, to talk about what, um, everything that is going on uh, right now. I think it would be just uh, too easy not to say anything and jump uh, right to, to the interview. But after reading, you know, watching, listening to all the reports, and yeah, talking to good friends, uh, some that have been passing, uh, experiencing the difficulties, you know, that uh, black people are, well, not are at the moment, have been enduring for so long. Um, I am convinced that um, if we don't do anything, we kind of become part of the problem, right? So I'm not going to give like moral lectures or anything about it. I just really think that any little action counts uh, what I'm doing here is uh, sharing a few links that I received from dear friends that are, you know, are suffering really with, uh, with the situation. So if you go to the description of the video uh, later on, if you just want to inform yourself, and this is what I would ask you to do, uh, so you can engage in, in a civilized conversation, try to be part of the solution of that and really uh, make an effort to make this stop right we are in sports uh, there are cases of racism in sports and we really would be great if everyone sort of watching to a little something if we can contribute uh for that you know the terrible situation to stop okay so let's stand um against racism uh i'm gonna go back to to, to the interview now I just it was a parenthesis i thought it was important um and uh, yes so gabriel uh let me invite you uh, in the conversation uh gabriel is a good friend of mine the brazilian doesn't sound brazilian when he speaks english uh because he's also british i think and uh lived all over the world uh former rugby player amateur i think and is a sports psychologist uh, he studies sports management and sports psychology and we had the previous conversation about, you know, overcoming uh, the psychological challenges of people that are now looking for a job. I thought that was super interesting to talk that uh, we had and decided to bring him in so he can share a lot of, um, you know, his knowledge about that topic. And yeah, let's see. I mean, it's a difficult situation for everyone um, within the crisis, even for people that are employed maybe stressed, concerned about perhaps losing their job. So um, I'm sure that will be a, a great conversation. So Gabriel, thank you for, uh, for coming. No problem, okay. it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. And also I just wanna say thank you for bringing uh, the topic up uh, of race beforehand because it is a very important topic that we do need to, to engage in. 
um, everybody does. Uh, but as you said, uh, here we're, we're going to be sp speaking more of, of careers and the psychological effects of, of not really being in a career at the, at the moment and, and, and transitions. Um, so let me, I'm just going to give a bit of background if, if that's okay on myself. Yeah, I was, that, that was actually going to be my, my first question. So if, if you can sort of uh, introduce um, yourself, talk about your career, because one thing that um, I also want to to let people know, and of course you're going to tell about it, is that you can actually bring experience on the two sides. You, you have your psychology degree, um, you have uh, worked um, in that field, but you're also being a sports worker, I mean, working in, in events, so going from one job to another, so you also experienced a lot in many occasions uh, that, uh, you know, the, the challenges of being without a job and actually looking for, for the next step. So, Gabriel, if you could actually give that uh, background for us to start the conversation. Yeah, so uh, I, don't, I don't really have an official name for what I do. I call myself a sports nomad because uh, in the past 10 years, I've worked uh, 12 different major events between Olympic Games, World Cup, Commonwealth Games, African Games. And I'm always jumping from one to, to the other, a lot of times in different positions, in different roles. And I kind of fell into it. I started off, uh, I graduated with a psychology degree from the University of Connecticut in the US. Uh, and as I was a rugby player at that point, I was really into sports and the benefits of sports uh, could have. And I pursued a degree in sports psychology uh, in Australia, University of Western Sydney, and pursued that for, for a few years. And then I decided that I wanted to transition into management. I went into, into sports management, completed the FIFA Masters, and then after a few years got into this role of different events, which is a very beautiful uh, lifestyle to be in. Like I said, I've been in 10 different uh, countries in the past 10 years in 12 different events, but a lot of people only see the event. They don't see the gaps in between, which sometimes can be six days, six weeks, six months. And, and that is the part uh, that people don't really see. So as Ron said, today I'm going to be speaking through that mix of experiences. Uh, part of it will be as a sports psychologist and how to deal with it. And also part of it will be my own experience in transitioning uh, from job to job. Great, great, Gabriel, just uh, some messages um, coming in. So Christine um, from Lausanne, um, also Patrick Casto, a friend watching us, hey Patrick, um, he couldn't, uh, couldn't miss you. There is um, another of our alumni friends, so uh, Gabe and I, did the, the FIFA Masters, so we are part of the same uh, alumni group. There is Alex, hello. Um, Regina saying hi from Brazil. There is also Ricardo from, from Italy and Leonardo from Nice. Thank you for, uh, for being there and telling us uh, where you're talking from. Um, as well, I, I wanted to know if you are at the moment looking for a job um, or not, and uh, if you experienced um, recently that uh, feeling of you know, not really knowing what to do, and that's what we're going to talk about. So, hello, Andrea from Mexico. So, there's uh, people from all over the, the world watching us. Uh, I, I would like to start, uh, Gabriel, actually, I mean, as you mentioned, you've been going from one place to, to another. So if we could start straight from, I mean, sort of advice to people that are in that situation uh, at the moment, not only about um, where do you find jobs and how to apply, it's not about uh, how to do your CV, but actually how you prepare your mindset to deal with that difficult situation. And so you can uh, eventually uh, achieve what's, um, what you want. Yeah, so that, that's a very um, interesting question. Like I said, I transition a lot between jobs and people who are looking for a job, they're coming from somewhere else. Uh, they're transitioning as well. So either they have just recently graduated and then they're going to be looking for a job or they had a job and maybe lost it and then they're going to be looking for another job or they want to leave it. 
So the way that, that I look at this, I look at this uh, a bit as a process in grief. Because if we look at, at the word loss, when you lose something, uh, it can be if you lose a loved one, if you lose a limb, if you lose an opportunity, all those things create grief. And sometimes losing a job, you create, you have a sense of grief as well. It can be if you have a job for a long time and you lose it, you're losing a bit of your identity. Think about how you introduce yourself to someone when you talk to someone that you first met. One of the first questions is, what do you do? And that is part of who you are. So in that process of grief, uh, there's the, the traditional model that people like to use, the classic model of uh, Kubler-Ross. They use five stages. And they call these five stages of grief, um, anger, denial, pleading, depression, and acceptance. I don't particularly use this model. I like using it as an example. I think it's very good at recognizing these emotions that happen. But one of the misconceptions is, is that it's linear, that you go through these phases in that order, anger, denial, depression, etc., cetera, and, and then you, you reach acceptance at some point. It's not that easy uh, because a lot of times you can bounce from one to the other. You can be in depression, move to anger, back to denial, back to depression. Uh, and sometimes acceptance is, is so difficult. So one of the important things is switching that acceptance into adjustment and adaptation because you're in a new reality. When, when you have lost someone or something, you, you have a new reality and you need to adjust to it. So this happens a lot in sports and with athletes, athletes that have dedicated years, years of their life to be uh, a football player and suddenly they retire, they lose that part of their identity. And it happens a lot with jobs as well. Uh, and with college students, you're no longer a college student. Now you're someone in the workforce and, and it's quite important on how to deal with that situation in that adaptation. So, one of the main important things of this adaptation and transition when you're in these gaps is to stay busy. Staying busy helps you adapt, helps you adjust, and staying busy in a variety of ways, personally, which includes physically, mentally, and creatively, and professionally. So staying busy personally, it really helps you maintain um, mental well-being, mental, a good mental health also physically to, to keep your physical health, but also creatively. Um, if you've never tried to paint, to draw, to write, to sing, and you have the time now, you're in a period of transition, this is the time to do it because it also is a healthy expression of what you're going through. And then trying to stay busy professionally. These days, there's so many talks that you can hear on, online, so many conferences, so many courses you can take. So it's very important for you to stay busy in those ways. So uh, the most important thing, the, the key that I want you to, to get out of this is, is you don't have to accept the situation you're in, but you do have to adapt to it. Share, share with us uh, some ways that you kept yourself busy when you were in that uh, situation. So, so the, I, I know that uh, <laughs> you published a book. Uh, it's one of the things. So I don't know if uh, everyone will have the the time or, or the talent to go on and publish a book. But um, tell us about that, that experience a, a bit more. Yeah, so that was actually in between one of the bigger gaps that I had. I decided that I've always liked writing. I've always enjoyed it. And I decided that I was put, going to put some effort into it, into actually writing a full book, a collection of short stories, editing it, putting the effort and, and self-publish it. And that was very important for me because it gave me a sense of purpose because there was a lot of frustration when I was applying for jobs and I was getting rejection letters or even worse, wasn't getting any letters back, wasn't getting any feedback. And that kept me busy. I kept having a goal. Okay, today I'm going to write this many chapters. Today I'm going to edit this. Today I'm going to do that. Rather than just be dwelling on, on what was happening in my job search, I had something that gave me joy. Uh, that I was doing, that was keeping me busy. It was keeping me mentally and creatively active. Cool, cool. Um, one thing I want to, to talk about is uh, preparing to, to do this interview, actually, Gabe sent me a, 
an essay, which uh, at first when I saw that, well, I think, I don't know if it was eight or 11 pages or something. And then I said, well, I'm gonna take a read it uh, some other time. And so that's a lot. And then when I started, I couldn't stop reading. So that was top notch. I said to him that, that that was too good. And since we just launched um, a new group on LinkedIn, by the way, you're all invited to to participate. So we have our LinkedIn page, I work in sport. Uh, it's uh, the company page, but now we just launched um, a community, uh, a group where everybody can contribute. And um, Gabriel already agreed to, to do so. Uh, publishing this essay there, which is super cool. So I recommend that you also read in depth. But anyway, so um, one, one of the aspects uh, of the topics that, uh, that you wrote there was about um, focusing in actual areas that you can control, right? And you mentioned um, someone I'd never heard of. It's a, apparently a surf psychologist, Richard Bennett, right? Can you maybe uh, talk more about it? Because I thought that was um, super cool in your in your essay. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I started when I, when Joan asked me to start talking about this, and we were focusing mostly on, on the crisis caused by by the pandemic by COVID. And I was started to think uh, now that we're going from the first wave of the pandemic to the second wave of the pandemic. It really hit me that there's there's a metaphor here with actual waves and when i was in australia doing uh, sports psychology i met a sports psychologist called richard bennett who wrote a book on surf psychologist on surf psychology sorry uh called the surfer's mind and it's a it's an excellent read even if you're not a surfer i mean i'm i'm brazilian but i don't surf i know that's odd but uh i snowboard instead but it's a, a very interesting book in the way that he speaks of how people should be interacting with the ocean as a surfer and what you can control in, in those situations. So if we look at it, I'm going to be using a lot of surfing metaphors, but I'll also be switching back to uh, the point at hand, which is careers. Now he uses the, these four aspects of control, which is mind, body, equipment, and ocean. And if we think of the mind as the mind, the body as the body, that one stays the same. But equipment, what do we have when you're going into a job, uh, into an interview, into a new career? It's your experience and, and your knowledge and your education. So that's the equipment, which much like uh, physical equipment, you need to work on and you need to improve. And then there's the ocean, which is what you need to interact with, which is the environment. It is everything around us. It's society. It's in particular the working environment that you want to work, that you want to get to which is different if you want to get into marketing, it's different if you want to get into sports, it's different if you want to get into law and all those things. So that's the, the, the ocean, that's our environment. And if we start speaking of the mind, one very important thing is that you can control your mind. People sometimes forget this. People sometimes have been repeating so many things over in their heads for so many years that they forget that they can change the narrative that is going on through your mind, that you can change um, your attitude towards different situations. It is an aspect of yourself that, that you can always be in control of, of what's going on and how you react to different things. So regardless of what's going on around you, you can control your mind, but um, it's important to say that it's, it's not that easy. It's not that easy, especially depending on the situation. When you're in situations that you don't feel you can control, uh, your, your mind will be racing. But if you practice it in terms of relaxation, getting your mind in the right setting, uh, you can control what's going on through your head. Now, sometimes people think, oh, but when I'm feeling anxious, I can't, I can't control it. Let's think about this for a second as we transition to the next one, which is the body. When you're feeling anxious, a lot of it is your body's response, is the butterflies in the pit of your stomach. So you might feel this when you're going into a job interview. You might feel nervous. You might feel anxious. And let's think about this the same way as if you're going bungee jumping. You're about to go jump off a cliff with just a big rubber band tied to your, to your ankles. And there's going to be some adrenaline rushing through, rushing through your body. And that's going to make you anxious. 
but is it really anxiety or is it that you think that that's perceptions anxiety? Because if the same person that's going bungee jumping, instead of looking at it as I'm nervous, this is risky, uh, what if I fall? If they're looking at it as a new experience, if they're looking at it as something exciting, I'm going to get to fly for a few seconds. I'm going to be hanging here from a cliff. That anxiety, that adrenaline still builds, but you don't, you stop thinking of it as being anxious. You start thinking of it as excitement. And that's when sometimes your, your, your mind can reinterpret what is going on through your, through your body. And it's very important for situations like when you go into a job interview, when you start feeling that anxiety is switching the narrative into something of the excitement of the prospect of possibly getting a new job. So it's interesting to look at that the same action can create a completely different reaction depending on, on your attitude. So if you're about to jump off a cliff from bungee jumping, two different people can have same different uh, reactions. And even yourself, the first time you do it, you could be very anxious. And the second time you could be very excited. So that's, that's right. the, the part of the, of the, of the body. Then we go into, into the next aspect of it, which is, which is the equipment. Now, equipment is something that we have some control over, but a lot of times it's, it's the environment that has more control than we do. If, we're, if we go back to a surfing metaphor, the equipment here would be the surfboard. And you need as best as possible to cater this to yourself, to your size, to your skill level. Uh, and what do you intend on doing? Do you just want a relaxing surf, in which case you'd, need, you'd want the long board? Or do you want to do tricks, in which you need a shorter board? When you think about your equipment as your education and your knowledge, you also need to think of how do you build this and what fits with you. You're not going to want to pursue a job that doesn't fit what you want to do and what you like to do. So it's something that always needs to be worked on and always needs to, to be improved. The other important thing is, is deciding how you want your equipment to interact with your environment. How do you want your board to interact with the ocean? How do you want your education and your knowledge to interact in, in your jobs? Um, and then you, you need to find the best equipment that's gonna fit you and your environment. And then we get into the aspect of of the environment. Now, this is the, the trickier one because this is the one where you have no control over it. Uh, you go into the ocean, uh, the waves are big, the waves are small. The only thing you can decide is do I want to actually go into this ocean? Which again, in, in the job market is the same thing. Do I want to go into marketing? Do I want to go into sports? Do I want to go in, into something else? That's as far as you can choose beyond that there's very little that, that, uh, that you're choosing and, and controlling. Now, yeah. yep. No, no, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so then when I was thinking about COVID and what's going on with the pandemic and this idea of, of control, a lot of people have lost their jobs and it's completely out of their control in, in a lot of different ways. And this is very similar to when someone is surfing and all of a sudden they fall in and they get trapped under uh, under a wave because it comes out it, this came out of nowhere uh, and a lot of people who had very steady jobs all of a sudden lost them and even people who were expecting to start new jobs haven't had that opportunity and there is that sense that when it just happens of that feeling of loss of control which is the same not exactly the same, but it's, it's similar to when you're on a surfboard on the ocean and the wave knocks you over and you're, doubt, you're out and under the water. Now, in this case, when you're under the water, the environment is pushing you around, around from one place to the other. Your equipment in this case, which is the surfboard, is who knows where. You have no, no control of where that is. And in this case, for example, your education and the knowledge that you have isn't really helping you because the situation is, is so out of control. And even your body, a lot, of, a lot of your body, you don't have control over because you're being pushed around by these waves. But this is the important part. 
And what do you do? That's the thing. You you st you need to remain calm, but the most important part to main, remain calm starts with your mind. As I said in the beginning, the mind is the part that you can control all the time. That is the part that you that you need to calm yourself, because if you panic, if you lose control of your own mind, and for example, you lose you forget to hold your breath, or you are so anxious that you don't think you can hold your breath any longer underwater, that's when you're going to have problems. If you remain calm and wait for the wave to pass, then you can reevaluate what's going on. So the, the most important thing in a crisis is to first regain control of your mind and what's going on in your, in your head, to then re start regaining control of the other aspects that you have some control of it. So this this uh, metaphor for me, uh, I, I think, fits very well in the idea of when the wave stops hitting you, you regain control of your body and you can swim up and look up. You need to reevaluate what's happening around you in your environment and you need to reconsider. You need to think, look, actually, the waves here are quite big. I don't think I can handle it or there's something wrong. In this case, uh, because it's something so big, so unknown, Let's just say a, a big pile of trash came into the ocean and you can't be in that ocean anymore. So you need to reevaluate where do you want to go. So you might need to step off the beach and try and find another one. So in this case, you might not work in the field that you want, but you need to go out and find another one. So yeah. it's very important when dealing with it, when, with the environment around you is reevaluating the environment that you're in. And do I have the tools that I need to be in this environment? Are they still valid? So, um, as I said before, in, in the adjustments, you reevaluate and you adjust. Sometimes you might not need it. Sometimes you might just have a bit of a change of strategy and you go back in. Sometimes you need to find a new ocean or new equipment. Yeah. So, I think this is yeah. a strong metaphor, a strong analogy. Um, it can resonate even if you don't surf, like it's uh, it's your case. And um, in fact, there are some comments about uh, that here. So Lee Neil says that uh, if you can't stop the waves, uh, you can't stop, but you can learn how to surf. And um, Janelle comments on that as well. Nice analogy, uh, Gabe can relate this. Uh, I was unable to start a new job due to COVID. Uh, just have to focus on what you can control and be patient. Good to see you both. Good to see you, uh, Janelle. Thank you for for the comments. There's a few more that uh, that came through. So, uh, Ign Ignitics, Ignitics uh, asks, uh, what is the name of your book? Uh, well, actually, you can give again the name of the two books. The one um, that you just mentioned, this uh, Surf uh, Psychology, and then your own, which is not sports related. Yeah, so, so the, the book by Richard Bennett is The Surfer's Mind. Uh, it's on surf psychology. It's, it's very good, so The Surfer's Mind. Uh, my book has absolutely nothing to do with, with any sport or psychology. Um, it really was just me experimenting with it. It's called Dead Dodos Tell No Tales, and it's just a collection of short stories. It, it was really just an experiment to, to, to stay busy while, while I was uh, trying to figure out my own plans, while I was readjusting and reevaluating my environment at that point. Right. I always thought that was a great uh, title for a um, rock uh, album as well. Uh, there is uh, Valeria watching us from Lausanne. Hi, Valeria. Idia uh, from uh, Bali. And Mohamed uh, Reza from uh, Tehran. Um, great, great to, to have everyone there. There's another comment uh, from Christine. Uh, that just um, came. Love the stuff analogy. So do I. Thank you, Christine. Actually, if you guys are enjoying, if you want to show your love to Gabriel, that act that actually uh, it's quite late at night where he is at the moment. I don't know how late is that. You're in Tokyo, right? Yeah, it's only it's only ten thirty at night. It's not too late. Only, only ten thirty at night, but uh, great that you're spending that uh, time with us. If you guys want to show your appreciation to Gabriel, hit that like button. He will. Love that. So will I. Uh, Gabriel, getting a bit more practical, um, you also, in, in, in that uh, document that you sent, 
mention a, an interesting and a very common situation that you mentioned as a, a catch-22, which is there's some po a point in your career when whenever you're looking for a job, it's expected that you'll have some experience, at least some experience to start any job, apparently. But the problem is if you don't have an experience, you can't get that experience, so don't start the job. You mentioned that's uh, much better than I did now uh, in your in your paper that we're going to, to publish. Don't forget, so I want the final version. Um, but maybe if you can elaborate uh, more on that and actually share exactly what you're talking about and how you you dealt with that uh, situation. Yeah, so th this was something that happened as soon as I finished my, my master's degree in, in sports psychology. Uh, when I was applying for jobs, a lot of people were looking for people with experience. But for me to get experience, I, I couldn't get experience because I didn't have experience. And it, it, was, it was a very frustrating uh, moment in my life, especially a lot because I, I got a lot of the you're overqualified type of thing because I had a master's degree. So a lot of people said I was overqualified, um, which made no, no sense to me at, at the time. Uh, so in this catch 22, th there's two things that, that, that I want to talk about here. And both I didn't really appreciate until many years later. Uh, one was appreciating the job I had then. So throughout my, my master's degree, I was a bartender. Um, so I bartended a lot throughout my degree and also bartended uh, quite a lot afterwards just to make ends meet uh, while I was looking for that experience. And I didn't realize how much I learned about dealing with people and dealing with chaos working behind that bar. It was a backpacker bar in, uh, in, in Bondi Beach in Australia, extremely rowdy, extremely busy. And I had to think quickly on my feet just in terms of organizationally, how do I serve all these people so quickly? How do I deal with, with all these people and dealing with people in general? So one thing people don't appreciate in, in relation to experience are experiences that you have because of the perception that people have. They think, oh, a bartender, there's no, no brain work involved. But there is a lot of different situations that you have in that. So you need to appreciate a bit of the experiences that you currently have. Even with, with teams and sports, if you're doing a sport, if you're captain of a team, for example, that is some experience. So it is knowing what is an experience. Um, but the other thing I did was I, I first start. I had big dreams when I, when I first graduated. So it was good job with good pay. That wasn't happening. So I said, okay, either a good, good job or good pay. That wasn't happening either. So I went for an okay job and zero pay. I ended up volunteering. So I volunteered for the uh, Australian Commonwealth Games Federation. They had, uh, they were going to host the 2006 Commonwealth Games and they sent volunteers out to all the Commonwealth countries in, of, of the Commonwealth of the world. And I ended up in, in Zambia as a volunteer. And it was an interesting experience because they weren't too sure what, uh, what they wanted me to do. I wasn't too sure what I should be doing, but we ended up uh, meeting somewhere in the middle and it became quite a, quite a good experience uh, to do that. So as I was saying before, this is one of that key as well, staying busy. Uh, if you stay busy actively, things will eventually start coming together. So I started adding all those little experiences together. And as I, as I said, it took me a few years to really fully appreciate everything that I, that I had gone through. But after that experience, things started falling back into place um, little by little. Uh, the FIFA Masters, for example, I'm sure I was able to get in because of that experience in, in, in Zambia, because that gave me a different story. It made me a bit more, more unique. So if you're in a position now that you, don't, that you can't have a job, go out and volunteer. Um, go out and find something creative to do. Use this actual, this moment um, of COVID where people need help. Uh, if, you can make, uh, three, if you can make masks out of 3D uh, printers, if you can help do shopping for the elderly people in your building, Something like that. Have a story. Have it 
because an experience doesn't mean a job. It means an experience, uh, something that you're doing, something that you tell. So stay busy, volunteer, and have a story. And tell it. Hmm? And tell it. And tell it, exactly. And, and tell it. Don't, don't, don't just keep it to, to yourself. And, um, well, I, you touched on, um, what I think what Bernardo's uh, here uh, commented or asked, really, how can we convince ourselves to make a first step in sports industry? Because sometimes we feel that we don't fit anywhere around this industry because of lack of, of experience. I think that you pretty much talked about it. A anything else that you would like to add? So no, um, the thing, the, the good thing about sports is they're always looking for volunteers. Uh, most sport events are, um, not necessarily run by volunteers, but they rely a lot on volunteers to help. And you can start with small steps. If, if you, even if you've never done a sport in your life, um, people welcome the, the volunteers. The most important thing is going in with energy and energy isn't something that you need to be running around all the time. I, I've had volunteers. I had a volunteer in Toronto. She was close to 90 years old, if I'm not mistaken. I think she was 85. And she was one of the most energetic people there was. Like she couldn't get to places quickly, but she was very willing and an and energy that just resonated from her. Um, I remember we, we uh, they had to carry the 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 the, the, the boxes with the with the athletes' equipment, each athlete, and someone had assigned it her by mistake because they didn't look at the age. They just saw the names and they assigned her to that, and she very happily went there to, with the box, and. Someone said to me, "Oh my goodness, uh, uh, Betty has a box. You know, we should, we should, uh, we should take it from her." And I looked at her and I said, "I'm not going to take that from her. Look at her; she's she's ready, willing, and able to go." And she did as much as she could. So, like I said, you might not have ex any experience in the sport. Just go in there with an open mind and energy, and they should embrace you. But it's not all fun and games either, right? There is, uh, there can be uh, a lot of frustration. Is that correct? Before, is, before, yeah, yeah. I loved uh, what you said. Have a story. Thank you for uh, following us, uh, Ines. Let's talk about all, also the the other side that people think, you know, they're going to go to a sports event and of course it's going to be a lot of work, but I mean, it's sports, uh, it's fun, it's fun and games, and but that can be very frustrating sometimes as well. Yeah, so there's there, there's two things here when, when we speak of, of, of frustration. Um, there's the frustration that's happening now, and then there's the frustrations that you carry with you, which are are two very different things. Uh, I think the one that that is worse is the one that you carry with you, uh, because you have no crystal. You we we can't see into the future, but the thing is, you also can't look into the into the an alternate past. Uh, like I, I said, in I regretted my decision to go to Zambia for actually uh, a few years because after that, things happened really slowly and, and I thought I could have progressed quicker. And the problem with that is that I glorified a past that never happened. I thought, oh, if I had just stayed in Australia, I would have eventually gotten a job and I, I would have eventually ended up with a team and I would have eventually done this. Um, but what happened was I went to Zambia, I did that, uh, that experience, went back to Australia, ended up back to bartending, struggling to, to make ends meet again, and slowly had getting a bit more psychology clients, slowly getting involved in more events. So for a long time, I, I, I regretted that until a few years later, I got into the FIFA masters because of that Zambia experience. And then a few years after that, I got into... I was offered a job at my first Olympic Games in London as the Africa coordinator, which I am absolutely sure I wouldn't have gotten if I had not worked in Zambia with, with the National Olympic Committee of Zambia. So it was an experience that took me a few years to really appreciate what it was. So when you're looking back at your frustrations, because a lot of us have been through frustrating moments, don't glorify it. Don't, don't imagine that it would have been beautiful if you had made uh, a different uh, different decision 
also think of what could have gone wrong at it as well. So that is one of the exercises for you to start changing that, uh, that frame of mind. Now that's frustration that's happening in the past, which is an important thing to, to deal with as well. So you can move on in the future. Uh, don't get me wrong. It's, it's very important to look in to the past decisions. As they say, you study history so you don't repeat the mistakes, but look at the facts. Don't look at the what could have been, because that is actually quite harmful. Cool. Now, if we talk about the frustrations that are happening now, happening at present, um, I had a, a, a very frustrating experience in one of the games that, that I was working in. And the most frustrating part of it was I actually had a lot of decision-making power in those games. It's probably the games in which I had the most decision-making uh, power that I've done so far, but a lot of things were completely out of my control. So uh, we had rowing boats that needed to, to come from China. And when everything was said and done, they sent, they told me, oh, the, the boats will be arriving in July, which was a bit of a problem because the event was in June. So I was essentially going to have to cancel this. And it was very frustrating because I, there was nothing I could really do. I couldn't go out and physically go to the South China Sea and swim out with a container and bring these rowing boats. And here's the thing that, that, that I want to talk about in terms of frustration is the difference between frustration and stress. When you're stressed, you're bringing that onto yourself. That is emotions that, you're, that, that, are, that are building up. Uh, I'm not saying it's easy to, to not be stressed. There are a lot of situations that, in which you're stressed, but you need to change that perception. If you don't have control over the situation, there's no point in being stressed about it because you have no control. It's okay to be frustrated, but don't allow yourself, don't allow your, your body and your emotions and your mind to deteriorate by feeling um, that you're stressed. So I first, uh, first thing I worked on was reducing that anxiety of stress. Like, okay, um, I'm frustrated, but what can, what can I do? And I started to think a bit more creatively, like, okay, who do I know that needs rowing boats? And I started making a bunch of phone calls here and there. And we ended up diverting the boats that we were going to get that were going to come late to a different group of people that also needed uh, rowing boats, but they weren't pressed for time. And we ended up getting their boats that were coming from Europe. And it arrived the day that the athletes arrived. Um, so the thing here is the frustration turned into a challenge. It turned into a puzzle. Like, how do I solve this puzzle? And the same way, we, we had also a, another problem, which was the basketball flooring. We had basketball three on three. Uh, the flooring went, was supposed to go from Antwerp straight to uh, Cape Verde. It went from Antwerp to the Canary Islands to, I think, Madeira, to another island, to somewhere else, to somewhere else. Uh, and, and again, I, I, I couldn't control it. I couldn't go in and physically go get the boats uh, and, and the parts that I needed. And it became another challenge. So what we thought about was like, okay, what do we do if these don't arrive in time? So we formulated a plan B and a plan C to figure this out. So what, I, what I'm saying is frustrations, you need to look at them as challenges, as puzzles for you to solve. Don't allow it to be, eventually become into stress. Like I said, you're, you're stressing about things that you can't control. And if you can control it, then also there's no use stressing about it because you can do something about it and try and find a solution. So look at these frustrations as challenges and be solution-based rather than problem-based. Don't look at what the problem is. Look, okay, what is the solution? How do we find a solution? Oh, well, that's uh, a great advice. Very wise. I totally agree with that. And But sorry, just one thing that I, I want to say, just in terms of think about sports and the sense of satisfaction when you see your, your, your favorite team winning a difficult game. So the, the favorite, I'm sure the favorite memory you have of a competition that you were in or, or that you saw wasn't the easy one. 
it wasn't the one that, that you won 10-0. It was yeah. that one that was 3-2, and you scored the last two goals in the last five minutes. So those frustrations are the ones that become challenges and the sense of satisfaction and fulfillment that comes from overcoming that challenge. Great, a great game. Um, listen, Romana, apparently someone you know, gives what an inspiration and honor to have match at the London Games. And blessed now to call you a friend. So I don't know where Romana is at the moment, but uh, thank you for, for the message. Um, Gabe, I mean, every crisis is in a way different and they have some similarities and, and differences. But in terms of how you deal with the prospects of unemployment, are all crises the same in that aspect or should the current one be treated uh, differently? So they're, they're all different. Um, again, if we look, if we go back to that surfing metaphor, that wave, every wave that crashes on you is different. It can be a big wave, it can be a small wave. Uh, you could have fallen because of the wind there could have been a fish that uh, came out and hit your board and fell in. The most important thing is the evaluation of that crisis and what do you need to change and what do you need to adjust and adapt to that crisis. Uh, the one that we're in now is one that is, that is very unique because it's one that is around the world. It's one that's global. It's one that everybody recognizes. So it's going to be very interesting, um, the job market for the next couple of years, because it's going to be interesting to see how many employers actually ask, what did you do during the pandemic? I know if next time I hire someone, if it's within the next couple of years, I'm going to ask that. Because I think what the people do now really says a lot about what, who they are and the potential that they have given limited resources. So were they creative? Did they uh, try to improve themselves? Did they try and help others? And this is really where that have a story becomes very important because right now, a lot of people are gonna have a, a months long gap in their CV, but you, you don't need to have that gap if you're doing something, if you have a story to tell. There is um, something very, interesting to say depending on how you're dealing with it in which you can put in a cover letter in which you can put it on a cv and that's one thing that we also need to rethink the way we think of, of cvs and cover letters it doesn't just have to be my job was this and i did this it can be i couldn't get into the job industry because um the covid19 pandemic started However, I proactively volunteered at a hospital. I proactively um, made gel in, in, in my bathtub. Uh, I started learning French so I could work in this industry. I started watching these things. I started improving myself. I lost 50 kilos. Whatever it is, whatever you did, have that be a story. Um, and the other, the other thing I wanna mention is uh, some people say, oh, I, I got lucky when I got this job, which, Luck, I always find, is an interesting term. The way I see luck is when preparation and opportunity meet. When the opportunity arrives, you need to be prepared to take it, to take that opportunity. So as an example, think of if you're in an elevator and you realize that in that same elevator is the person that um, that is going to interview or you or the owner of of, uh, of a company, that is a lucky encounter. That is an opportunity, but then you need to take it. Are you prepared to take it? Do you have a story to tell them right away? Are you bold enough to say it, which is also part of the preparation? And do you have something interesting and pertinent to say to that person? And then like starting the conversation of, oh, I really like what you're doing with your company. I did this, this, and this during, during the pandemic, and I think I can bring an energy and a creativity to what you're doing here. So this, this part of having a story is very important, um, not just in the job market, but also in your interactions with people. Uh, one thing I've noticed so much these days is you're talking to people, hey, what are you doing? 
ah, you know, I'm just sitting around watching Netflix. Like the amount of people that, that have said that is, is so much. And I've been trying to change that, that, that narrative uh, of I've been doing exercise. I've been taking these online uh, psychology courses so I can have different aspects of psychology. I've been doing a lot of French. Uh, I've gone back to writing and all these little things uh, that you have to, to keep yourself busy, to have a story, to have something to talk about. So really the, 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 the keys are of all this is reevaluate the situation that you're in, reevaluate the environment. Do you want to stay in this environment? Do you want to switch environments? Do you have what it takes to be in the environment that you want to, to be? If you don't, how do you achieve that? How do you go back uh, to learning more, to get more experiences? And once you reevaluate, adjust and adapt and stay busy so you're able to adjust and adapt and keep a record, you know, have a story and then tell it. Yeah, definitely. One, one interesting advice that, you, that we got here in the last two interviews with uh, Daniel G and then with Patrick Nelly was, you know, when you're talking about the environment and in this sense, people, you know, wanting to work in sport, Sometimes, you know, a step to work in sports is actually go and work somewhere else first and get some sort of uh, preparation there and then come in. So it's not always a, a straight line. As you said, there's uh, many bumps um, on the road and turns that you, that you need to take. Um, Gabe, I think this has been fantastic. There's uh, loads of co comments that um, arrived here. So towards the end, I'm going to read a few. First one from Erika Frigerio, which also happens to be my wife, a full disclaimer. But uh, if you like this video, <laughs> Gabriel would really appreciate if you do that. Uh, so will I. Uh, there's a message here from a good friend of ours, so Hisham. Uh, he can totally relate with what you said. It reminds him of uh, the very single, every single CAF competition he managed, especially the AFCON had 45 days to hold uh, the 2015 edition. That's right, there was a change of uh, venues. It was only challenges, but a marvelous human journey when commitment uh, to succeed is there. Great to hear from you, Hisham. Um, there's a few others. There's Andrea. Diaz wants to know, how are you able to work in so many different countries? So that, that's an interesting thing. And that is, again, uh, on, on those challenges. But these are actually, I, I find them happy challenges. I find them joyful challenges to learning about different cultures. Uh, most of the time when I go to one of these countries, it, it's literally the first time that I've been there. So I went to Zambia, had never been to Zambia before, and, and I spent almost a year there. I... After London 2012, I was offered a job in Botswana. I had never been to Botswana, just packed up my things and went. The most important thing is to have, is to have an open mind and be flexible with, with their culture. Again, it's, it's the environment. You're not going to change the working environment in, in a country. Um, so you need to adjust to them. You need to uh, adjust a bit. Uh, and there's an interesting thing that, that I want to talk about because there's compromise and there's co cooperation. For, for a long time, I thought that what we need to do is, is find a compromise. But the more I think about compromises, you're always giving, someone has to give in, in some way or another. When you're co cooperating, you're all working together. So those have been the best instances uh, of working in different countries, when there's more cooperation rather than, than compromise, in which I respect their culture uh, of, where I am, where I'm working, and they respect mine as well. So it's 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 a it's an interesting work, but at the same time, I need to be ready to compromise because if I go to a new new country, um, and I and we have a clash of cultures, I'm the one that needs to be more understanding because I'm in their world. So, uh, for example, last year I was in Senegal, and I forced myself to speak French. I speak so so. But there, I, I didn't expect everybody to speak English to, to help me. I knew I was in a country that spoke French, so I need to adjust to that. I need to work more on my French. So just it's, it's about having that flexibility 
and and that adjustment and that uh, adaptation. So that that mantra of adaptation that I always have really helps me with um, all the different countries I've worked in. That's great. That's great, uh, Gabe. Um, Louise Donald uh, from Andorra, great advice and story. The unexpected situation we find ourselves in, it can be a powerful challenge leading us to innovate and grow, most definitely making more chapters of our story to be told. Um, thank you, Louise. There is a couple more comments here. Gabe, it was a real pleasure working with you and learning from your experience. Maybe you can talk about the project we worked in Senegal for the Olympic boxing qualifying uh, qualification. See you around, my friends. So you know a lot of people around the world, Gabe, and everybody loves you. So if you want to mention about this one specifically, very quickly, because we're running out of time? Um, well, I, I can't think of anything off the, because there was so much that, that was going on in, in those ones, uh, in, in that experience. It's, it's very complicated. But that is exactly one that I had to speak French. I actually became the director of security of the event the day before the event started for some reason, um, handling an entire crew uh, of Senegalese that uh, spoke very little English. And I quickly had to, to learn and, and speak French and adjusting and adapting to, to everything that, that was happening. So um, the first thing, and and sorry, while we're on the topic and because we're ending and because you started off with this, there, there's something oh, that- I'll just show an, another one, another mention to you, someone that I suppose you know as well, uh, Raul Martin. Uh, it was a great opportunity to try to uh, surf the waves in SAL. Um, SAL is the name of the competition, yeah? The yeah, no, Sal. Sal is uh, the island in Cape Verde, African Beach Games. Sal is in Cape Verde, so another thing I learned. I always learn new things here uh, at, uh, at this session. Some, um, yeah, so Raul, thank you so much for, for, for leaving the message. So to, to wrap up, uh, Gabe? Yeah, sorry, uh, João, because you brought this up, uh, and I think it is important uh, for us to, to speak about the, what you said in the beginning. <clears throat> um, I've, I've, I've thought a lot about this uh, in terms of what's going on in the United States right now and the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, matters movement. And with this whole thing of adapt, adapt, adaptation and adjustment and the perceptions that are in your mind, the biggest adaptation that really needs to happen, and it's important for us as white people to do it, because as I was saying, with compromise and cooperation, for so long, um, and uh, people of color have been having to compromise to live in, in a white world. And that's what's happened now is they've, they've realized that they don't have that cooperation and that's what needs to happen. And us as white people need to start thinking of not just not being racist, but being anti-racist. And I think that's the difference of this movement now is I only realize now how much I wasn't doing by just being not racist. Um, I yeah. really needed to be anti. Um, so when, when I was in school, I remember hearing those jokes of people doing uh, saying jokes of, about black people and all those things. And I never said anything. I just sat there quietly. I never thought they were funny, but sometimes you do a little ha <laughs> ha just because you want to fit in just because there, there's, you, you don't think there's any harm, but I think we need to actively start, um, working against this um, and we need to start adjusting our minds to really be anti-racist because we need to help these are our friends these are our co-workers these are our people that we love and we need to show this love and this support to them and i think that's that's very important definitely in in and it's definitely also not uh, an american thing it's not only something that happens in the USA, uh, it's all over us. As I said uh, at the beginning, I think every little thing counts. I think bringing up the subjects, I mean, with, with, with respect and, and do it, doing it seriously is, is a step. What uh, I'm doing uh, here, the way I'm trying to collaborate, as I mentioned at the beginning, I put in the description of the videos, a few, I think, useful links that I received from friends so we can inform ourselves 
and and learn and and share that and i think every small action uh counts so thank you again for touching on that uh gabe i'm i'm going to 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 finish here just uh with, with a few reminders if i can um just uh yes just to, 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 to remind you that we have this uh, new group on LinkedIn. So it would be excellent if you, if you follow us. It's uh, We Work in Sports. So the I Work in Sports uh, page now has uh, a group where everyone can collaborate. So we call that We Work in, in Sport. Um, you find us on, on LinkedIn. Uh, if you like... Uh, this interview and you know you appreciate it uh, Gabe being here if you want to be informed about uh, next interviews uh, coming up or next other videos subscribe you know hit the, that bell sign to, to get the messages this is where you you find us I work in sport.com um, yeah it was great to, to have you here we'll be back uh, next week it was great so stay safe and I see you soon.